Okay. Uh, I hope everybody can see that. So um, I'm Christopher Allen from Blockchain Commons. Uh, you know, our big goal is how do we create an open, interoperable secure and compassionate digital infrastructure to enable people to control their destiny um, and to maintain their human dignity online. Um, we are particularly focused now on working with developer communities um, around tools uh, for digital identity, digital assets, and responsible key management um, but these are based on our Gordian principles. Our, our Gordian principles are for independence, privacy, resilience, and openness. And those in turn are based on the self-sovereign identity principles. So that is really kind of the context where we came into uh, this, um, uh, this discussion. So uh, obviously I've been involved in uh, DIDs and verifiable credentials for a very long time. I'm a co-author of the uh, DID uh, 1.0 standard, and then I am also a co-author of the TLS uh, standard from the late 90s. Um, and I really wanted to talk with you as, you know, we I think you guys have done a great job with schemas and the VC uh, group has done a great job creating a, a data model. Um, I just really wanted us to take the next step. And the next step is significantly more privacy. So clearly, digital credentials are a better way of sharing. I mean, we wouldn't be in this meeting today if we didn't believe that to be true. I mean, they simplify administration. You know, you just create this thing that is a digital version of what you've done in the past. You digitally sign it, you put your public keys in a PKI, and to a certain extent, that's relatively simple. You know, you're publishing. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, they allow you to simplify your usage. The students can use them as they will. Uh, it's not necessary for, you know, a staffer in an institution to verify because a signature does that. And of course, there's no phone home. That, that's actually one of the first useful things from a verifiable credentials model um, is that the holder uh, can basically get it uh, verified without having to call home, um, uh, which, causes, uh, which could cause privacy problems. Um, but I also feel like digital credentials can be dangerous. Uh, all that we've done with them uh, is right now uh, make them better, but we haven't necessarily addressed the, the uh, problem. So in particular, how do you protect student privacy? So, you know, a subclass of that is how do you protect against discrimination against students? Um, but possibly even more important, especially given this group, which is working directly with universities and other educational institutions, is how do we reduce liability, especially given laws like GDPR, the CCPA in uh, California, and I've been involved with even more digital privacy laws that are emerging. So uh, what are the problems of digital credentials? Well. Obviously, an important one is identity theft. You know, you get three points of data about somebody and, you know, you're on well on the path of understanding who they are, why they are, what are their weaknesses, what are their strengths, et cetera. Um, so we're always trying to, to minimize this. Um, and credentials, even educational credentials, contain a huge amount of info. And a lot of stuff is, you know, um, uh, not properly boxed. So oftentimes you'll have, you know, personal identification issue to allow for uh, uh, auth authentication, which has really nothing to do with the credential uh, data. So, uh, you know, oftentimes in there will be things like birthdays, you know, real names, various ID numbers. Um, and these are often used by other parties as identity questions. Um, uh, but specific data can cause problems too. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, gender discrimination. Um, so uh, at the last rebooting, we had a young woman from Eastern Europe uh, who was a doctoral candidate come. And her basic thing was, you know, A, she's already dealing with gender discrimination. Um, but then she also graduated from a... Uh, uh, a, a Central European uh, uh, university. So she's also 
discriminated against as a Central European. And her name sounds uh, ethnic, and so she's also potentially discriminated on a religious. All data that's going to be on her, uh, her credentials. Uh, in addition to that, it may have their birthplace, it may have uh, various issuer location information, uh, other things that can be used for racial or um, uh, other things. There's age discrimination. When uh, I last uh, taught uh, in an MBA program, a uh, number of my students were in their 50s. And, uh, you know, in the years since that I've communicated with them, despite getting their MBA and such, uh, they felt discriminated against because of their age in at least the initial interviews with people. So uh, uh, faith-based school information, whether or not it's a, uh, a religious school or something that gives a clue uh, about religious uh, uh, details can also be used. And then, you know, in the basic problem is the more data, the more problems. So how do we solve this? And one of the simplest solutions is something that we call holder-based elision. So what is this? Um, our basic position is that data-filled credentials should be out, shouldn't be out in the wild as much as possible. Instead, let the holder redact the information as they see fit. Now, note very carefully, I'm not saying subject, I'm saying the holder redact information. Yes, the subject is the first holder, um, but there are a variety of reasons as these go out to HR departments, out to various accrediting bodies or loan review bodies, et cetera, where they become holders and they too may uh, need to be able to redact potentially in different ways that uh, meet their needs. So this allows all the parties to uh, you know, uh, eliminate potential discriminatory information, um, or partially reveal it. Um, uh, but the holders still have the full credential when it's needed because the signatures will still verify. So um, uh, thus the question of data retention, deletion, inclusion, et cetera, becomes more of a, uh, a, an issue for the holder and of course the holder's wallet, not the educational institution. So how do we, how does this work? So I'm gonna talk about one particular uh, approach to it. Uh, this is uh, from Blockchain Commons. Wolf is the uh, implementer. And it basically starts with a hash. I presume that everybody here knows, you know, what is a hash. Uh, I mean, it's a data fingerprint. You can see here, the input is hello world and it has a 256-bit uh, uh, hash. We also have beside it here, uh, something called a life hash, which is a, visual version of that that was uh, uh, invented by Wolf, because uh, it's really hard to read those numbers. I mean, everybody I know looks at like the first three and the last three, which isn't as secure, but if you see both the hash and a, a live print, you can feel uh, much more confident that uh, uh, two hashes are the same. Um, a very small change, just changing uh, the input uh, from an O to an umlaut O, makes for a drastic change both in the hash and in the live print. So that's what hashes are. They're fixed size, no matter what the size of the input is, you can kind of consider them to be, you know, the ultimate in lossy compression. Um, and hashes are one way, you can't back them out. Uh, and they're really a long series of numbers, but again, they can be made more visually uh, visible. So what is hash-based elision? So right now when you sign a document, um, uh, and then you remove the data, you can no longer verify the signatures. So you're kind of stuck without the data. So how do we allow the holder to remove the data without invalidating the signatures? So instead of signing the, the input, we're basically signing the hash. Now you could say it's pretty obvious because that's actually technically underneath the scenes what actually is happening. Um, but we're uh, making this even more explicit and designing it in the system. Um, but the key thing is that when the data is removed, the hash remains in the document. When the, when the data is restored, uh, you can verify that the data's hash matches the hash in the document. So uh, uh, let's take this up to the next level. What is a tree of hashes? So uh, data can be arranged in a tree. Oops, I'm, for some reason I'm not seeing the tree uh, image. There it is. Um, the uh, all similar uh, data is kept in the same branch. 
for credentials, all of a student's personally identifiable information might be in one branch, all of their qualifications might be another. Um, this organization continues down from there. Now this allows us to align uh, specific types of info. So how does this work? Um, you know, every bit has its own hash and uh, you know, it, uh, you know, is reflected all the way up to the root hash. This is a really old uh, and, you know, considered to be mature technology. The Merkle tree was invented in 1979. It was one of the first cryptography things. So we know how to do this well. Um, so what is hash-based elision? Well, if a document is a tree of hashes, then any change anywhere will invalidate the signature. So, you know, we see here, we sign this root document and it's basically, you know, anything changes and below, uh, boom, it propagates other upward and now the signature no longer verifies because the hash is different, right? Then um, uh, pretty basics. But with hash-based elision, the document is a tree of hashes, not a tree of the actual data. Then any branch can be removed while leaving the hash behind so that all the higher level signatures can be evaluated. So in this case, the root is also signed, uh, but we can choose to elide this particular document. Let's say that this is my age and I don't want to send that to somebody. Uh, it removes certain information about me. Um, I can send this along to someone else. And uh, given that elided information, uh, the signature still verifies, and maybe they don't care or not are not supposed to care about my age. Um, uh, they don't need that extra alighted information. Um, so this really allows for data minimization, which is the cornerstone of privacy. Uh, the basic reveal, reveal no more than what is needed. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, any kind of data minimization, in my opinion, requires some system of selective disclosure. Uh, there, are, there are a number of other approaches. I think this is one of the, the better ones because holder-based, hash-based elision makes students, allows student holders to make all of the initial decisions about how things are going to be shared. Um, so, you know, as people creating these credentials, why do we care? So we want meaningful credentials, but we also want to protect students and their futures. We want to protect vulnerable populations that are coming to our schools. Um, students are particularly vulnerable. They're young, they're away from home, they're away from their support systems, they're away oftentimes from their own cultures. You know, we have to protect them. And then of course we value diversity and we want to protect the diversity in our institutions. Um, and, uh, but we also want people to be able to uh, leave our institutions and get great jobs and careers and support our institutions in the future. Some other ways that it helps institutions is you don't have the admin of alighting credentials. The, the, the institution does not have to understand what the risk requirements of a, you know, a, uh, uh, somebody who is the third party in a verifiable credential, you know, the, the person that is hiring uh, the student now has some information about the student's credentials and they have very different needs. They may need to prove, hey, I've got 10 people in my organization who have these qualifications to some other body, but they don't want to give the people's names or anything allows other parties to, to poach those, student, those uh, employees. So they have a different holding and elision uh, requirement than what is needed. The institution doesn't need to have to understand this and how this works or enable it. It's just automatic with Gordian envelope. Um, thus, they also don't have the liability of overfull credentials, um, you know, having too much data in there because uh, it is all alightable by the, by the holders. This lowers your responsibility. I probably should have put a legal caveat here. You still have responsibilities in GDPR, but it lowers your responsibility for GDPR uh, because some of it is uh, and, you know, uh, uh, specific to the holder. Um, institutional compliance. Uh, elision can also protect institutions from violating laws. So for instance, oftentimes institutions need to be able to say, this number of students graduated to some body that is loaning money to students and wants to make sure that the institution is doing that. How do you exchange all of this thing to know what is the, the status of, uh, 
of uh, you know these students without violating their privacy. Well, with elision, you can prove yes, we have these number of students and this number of students is employed, and you know the the hash tree works and the and the uh, compliance uh, rules work for this. And uh, but I'm not giving you the names of the students and the names of the of the uh, their employees. Um, this is particularly important in the United States because of FERPA and uh, the PPRA, uh, which has very, very strong um, uh, requirements as far as uh, how information about students is passed forward. Um, and I think a lot of institutions are in violation uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, they're doing stuff that uh, allows others to violate the privacy. So, um, uh, so I don't think there's any case law that, that pulls it back to them, but institutions can clearly do better. In Europe, there isn't a specific law around uh, student information, but GDPR is pretty broad. And of course, uh, CCPA in California is, uh, uh, you know, kind of a variant CD GDPR-ish, um, some pros and cons, but there's a whole bunch more coming. Um, data uh, supporting data minimization can really help you provide compliance for a lot of these different kinds of rules and regulations. So that is in general uh, what is elision um, and why it's important. Uh, specific to Gordian envelope are some additional features. So there's this concept of something called a proof of inclusion. So Instead of uh, having a, an individual certificate, um, you can basically sign the root hash uh, and publish it uh, with no other information. Uh, then uh, when someone reveals their document to say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a student, uh, I, only the necessary hashes are revealed between the student's credential and this root hash. Um, and that allows for a lot of interesting use cases. Um, so that's one, one thing we really wanted to support natively. Um, one of the particular ones that I really like with this is something called herd privacy. The institution can give every student their credential like they do now, but with some additional information that uh, says, you know, where are they in the cohort? And then it, all the institution has to do is publish the public route for the entire cohort. So instead of giving out, uh, you know, a thousand uh, graduation credentials, certificate credentials, grade credentials, and all this type of stuff for a cohort of students, you can just publish a public, you know, a public route, and the students can choose uh, to um, uh, to prove that they were part of that particular cohort, the you know graduating class or the you know quarterly ending public route of something. This allows for a lot of uh, uh, additional anti-correlation capabilities and and such. Uh, it is, however, different than the classic verifiable credentials model. So there would have to be some adjustment to to uh, to think about it because, in some senses, you this is a giant verifiable credential for everybody in the class. Uh, rather than a uh, you know per individual per uh, per subject, um, uh, there is more. Uh, oop, I'm going the wrong direction. Um, sorry. So again, the student can prove inclusion in in uh, in a cohort. Also, another aspect of Gordian envelope is that we allow for a lot of different kinds of elisions. So. Um, uh, Gordian envelope, I'm sure all of you are uh, comfortable and familiar with uh, uh, triples. You know, Alice knows Bob. Uh, in this particular case, in the Gordian envelope, a node uh, is the, the kind of the, the leaf hash of Alice. It's assertions and the nose and Bob. So it's kind of, you can see the hat, there are five hashes here. Um, we can elide the subject. We can say that somebody knows Bob and have it be signed. We can say that Alice has some relationship to Bob, but not what that specific relationship is. Uh, we can say Alice knows somebody uh, you know, or has some um, uh, predicate uh, there. And uh, we can also just say Alice has a number of assertions, but we're not gonna tell you how many. Um, and of course, there is just the ability to have the single hash 
uh, route where everything is alighted. Um, and this gives for a lot more uh, choices as compared to some other uh, uh, elision specs. So right now, uh, these are the four major ones. Uh, there's SD Jot, which is being uh, run through the IETF. It leverages the verifiable credentials, Jot ecosystem, uh, DIF uses a lot of those. It's also related to the ISO, MDL, and MDOC uh, uh, standards that are being used for mobile driver's license. Uh, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it, they like it because it doesn't require schemas. Um, uh, which, uh, you know, if, if you're familiar with this area, that's uh, a complicated pro and con. Uh, a particular con is that the, the hash list is not a tree. They basically allied a whole claim from a, a list. So they basically have a list of claims and they say, well, we're going to allied, you know, three, five, and nine. Um, uh, so it is... Um, uh, not quite as flexible as a, a tree uh, version of it. There's LD uh, Merkle disclosure, which I think is a little less mature, but there is a W3C doc on it. Uh, the particular advantages of it is that it leverages the JSON LD ecosystem, uh, which I believe uh, the VCEDU community is using. Uh, it's particularly uh, convenient for node graph data. Uh, uh, but again, it is a, you know, a hash list, not a tree. You're just basically being able to elide an entire claim. And it does require you to have a node graph structure for your data and a schema for it to properly work. Um, Gordian Envelope is ours. It's data structure agnostic, meaning you can do graphs, uh, you can do lists, you can do schemas or no schemas. You can even do different kinds of graphs. You can do node graphs, you can do uh, uh, edge graphs, et cetera. So that gives it a lot more uh, capability that this is why we can offer things like redaction, inclusion proofs, herd privacy that I discussed earlier, but we can also encrypt data. We can put uh, you know, something in escrow uh, and still be able to verify it's signed. Uh, if it's a large object, we can compress it. And then we have some special capabilities as far as secret sharing. Um, the cons is it's not W3C VC centric. In some ways, it's a little bit below the VC. It's useful for many other purposes also, including DIDs and other data, but it's not on a standards track. We have submitted it to the IETF, um, and we hope at some point it will be standards track, but it's not been, you know, uh, accepted by uh, uh, an existing working group yet. Uh, finally, we have BBS Plus Signature, uh, which is being uh, uh, run through the ITF, but there are active people in the, uh, both the DIF and W3C communities in regarding, regarding it. Its main advantage is it allows for anti-correlation of signatures. That's something hash elision can't do. Uh, because what happens with it is you're offering proof of knowledge of an undisclosed signature and then correlating that. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful feature. Uh, it doesn't use hashes and instead uses a brand new cryptography. I would even argue two layers of it. It uses pairing cryptography and then it uses new cut cryptography on top of pairing cryptography. Um, the combination of this makes it more complicated and also there are, it's a little bit more complicated to do holder-based elision scenarios. Um, uh, but it's still a very powerful technology. Um, some final notes, digital credentials are powerful, simple credentials, cr credentials do not protect privacy. Both the holder and the issue ha issuer have risks. Um, they're also transient, they can be lost, there's too much information. We need strong, safe credentials with control by the holder, the ability to align, maintenance of signatures through hashing, and proofs for further data minimization. Uh, and I really need to put this call to action here. Holder-based elision is crucial for privacy. Uh, it can do more, I mean, I, if you're supporting uh, BBS plus proofs, fabulous. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't also be considering holder-based elision. Uh, we really need to turn some of these, oh, well, maybe we can do some privacy things. Uh, maybe we should do some privacy things and start putting them in musts. Uh, I'd like to see more specs, more uh, groups saying this must be done. Um, 
because legally data minimization really is a requirement. So why aren't we uh, doing that? Uh, ethically, if you're part of the self-sovereign community, you've also said that user control is a requirement. So we need to turn these into musts. Uh, we'd love for you to use Gordian Envelope, um, uh, you know, because it has some of these additional features, capabilities, uh, per privacy, et cetera. But if not, please, please use one of these other uh, elision specs for uh, your base. Uh, so more on Gordian, uh, uh, tiny URL Gordian Envelope. Uh, there's also uh, a bunch of very useful videos and transcripts of videos, et cetera, at this URL, uh, tiny URL, tiny URL, Gordian hyphen videos. And then specifically, there is this educational use case where we've tried to describe, you know, the utility of Gordian for, for that. And I'll uh, quickly show you what that looks like. So this is the educational use case. Uh, you know, we talk about various, what we call this a progressive use case, various official credentials, she restricts them, uh, somebody wants to hire her, she gives them their information, uh, later uh, there's an open badge, and then three kind of uh, uh, progressive herd privacy credentials. We'd really like to see contributions from this community to take this uh, educational and credential industry use case forward. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Christopher. It's a lot, but also really interesting and important. Um, I have, I'm, before we get to the queue, I see if we have Phil in the queue, but I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. you know, Could you explain to us how, um, how would a wallet, how would a VC wallet implement something like Ordian Envelope so that um, uh, an individual would know that they have the option to, you know, share limited um, pieces of data, and also how would a verifier request that? So how how would you um, apply this to the software? Simple kind of the software we have now. Right? Correct. So I mean, um, one of the problems with any of these types of things is it does put a greater burden um, not just on the the provider of the information. Um, in the form of the holder, uh, but also the verifier of the information. So my kind of take on it is it needs to be incentivized hand in hand, because to a certain extent, the holders don't want the information, I mean, the, the non-subject holders don't want the information uh, either. It becomes toxic data. So we really want to, you know, create systems where the, the verifier goes, this is the information I must have. Um, and so we've actually kind of written a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, at rebooting, uh, we have this uh, uh, draft paper called Selective Disclosure. Um, I'll send, put the link in the chat. Um, that talks about a different way of thinking about things, which is we really need to deeply understand, uh, you know, what we want and need to be correlated. Um, so uh, that's part of it. I think uh, there is a lot of exploration uh, to uh, uh, in UX of how to do this without overwhelming users. Um, uh, you know, my hope is that as we, you know, look carefully at these schemas and such, that we maybe break them apart a little bit more. It's one of the advantages of the tree structure um, that uh, uh, Gordian has, because on one hand, an institution uh, who is, you know, um, uh, making statements about authentication information of a user, which allows, you know, the, you know, it's kind of like the student ID type stuff for the purpose of then separately being able to validate the credential. Keeping those separate really helps. Um, and then within the credential itself, you know, having it have sub-credentials and things of that nature uh, will also help UX uh, in this. Um, so uh, one of the other things is I've written an article on something called progressive trust. Um, I think that anybody who's implementing this type of thing has to think in this sense. There is a, there is a desire among um, uh, developers in this community, which is, oh, I'm going to get this blob and I'm going to throw the blob into a box and the box is going to glow green and say, go, you're done. Okay. Um, I just don't think that's the way the the world works in the uh, in the in its patterns of trust. 
Uh, things are much more gray than that. You know, you only want the information you need for the risks that you're having at the moment. Uh, so that means the the the, the uh, verifiers need to be able to throw these blobs into the box and box come back. Uh, it's okay, but it, I just need one more thing and then go ask for the one more thing. And then the user can basically say, oh, do I really want to do this? I mean, why are they asking me for this one more thing? And I basically can decide, no, I don't want to give them this one more thing. Um, uh, you know, it's... Um, I don't need this, that job that bad. I've got other applicants who aren't asking for that information. I hope that helps. Yeah, I'd like to add something too, if that's okay. Oh, go ahead, Wolf, sure. Yeah, so um, what we try to do with Envelope is design a substrate that is very flexible. And because of the tree structure, as Christopher mentioned, um, you can have these triples, which are assertions, but you can also have assertions on the assertions, um, as many levels as you want. And so there's many possible structures that could emerge to make this easier for users. One would be, and of course, you know, and now that we design the substrate, we'd like to see people start to create tools and uh, standards around this substrate. Um, for instance, you could provide templates that say, okay, for a particular purpose, um, here's the required information from this credential that we need. And then you apply the template and it shows you, you know, in one step, essentially what's being alighted um, because, and only with the required information is left. Another possibility is that issuers can actually put assertions on various parts of the data saying this is potentially discriminatory. <laughs> and so the user can just uh, use a tool to say, eliminate all potentially discriminatory information or let me review it so I can decide what to alight. So there's a lot of uh, ways that these documents can be both constructed and manipulated such that uh, the user actually has a lot of transparency into the kind of information they're providing or choosing not to provide. Yeah, just to be clear on that, one of the differences between the sort of the node graph model of JSON-LD is that you know you 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 have this triple and then you have one more value um, that uh, you can add to that triple, which uh, allows for uh, the quad to function and do ordering and other different types of things. Um, we're not limited to that kind of structure. So, you know, you can basically have multiple assertions or mul multiple predicates around the same uh, claim. So you could have all kinds of annotation, sub annotations of things. And in fact, even the predicates can be envelopes. So they can have multiple assertions about the predicate to say, oh, this is an owl schema. This is a, you know, uh, uh, this is a, uh, you know, belongs to such and such a template or whatever. So um, again, it's a lot depends on whether or not you want to go up to the full flexibility of Gordian envelope. Um, if you're using J, uh, uh, LD Jot or, um, uh, no, it's not LD, it's, uh, Anyhow, you're, if you're using one of the selective disclosure um, alternatives in the JOT or JSON LD system, you won't be able to take advantage of those. But it, you know, you can at least say, you know, this one claim, uh, you know, I don't want to share. Right. Yeah, I, I'd also add that the the Christopher went through those five elision points in a, in a document. And of course, that applies to the, uh, you know all the way down the the, the tree. But any of those elision points can also be encrypted, public, uh, symmetrically encrypted, public key encrypted, uh, split into shares, which can be distributed to a, a group of parties where a quorum is required to actually reconstruct the secret uh, and uh, compressed, things like that. They're all available. Um, elision, obviously, is one way of protecting information, such as the holder has to provide the information, but it could be encrypted or other kinds of escrow. So it's very flexible. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna oversimplify it, and then really, Phil, I'm gonna hand it over to you in a second. Um, we uh, work with the Open Badge spec quite a bit in this space right now because it's the one that's really like aligned to VC so far, pretty closely in in education. Could it be so simple as um, that spec includes a property that says this is where you put this if if somebody just wants to know that uh, this person say it's a diploma, they just want to know if they wanted to graduate. And then we add a property for that to accommodate this. Um, would that um, be useful? There has been discussion in some other places where uh, admits another um, format, uh, you know, uh, you know, JSON or whatever. There is a uh, a Gordian uh, spot inside it. Um, Gordian is, uses Cbor. If you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. so that's a binary expression language. 
uh, that is determined, and we use a particular variant of CBOR called DCBOR, which is a term deterministic variant. Um, so our data is binary, but that being said, it can be, be because of the, you know, how we've done the layers, you can encode it any way you want. You can turn it into boring hex. You can have used various other compression things or whatever. But it is a self-describing format, and there are some real advantages to uh, using CBOR directly. And that is a, you know, an ITF standard, and there's lots of tooling out there for it. Um, the, it, it, uh, uh, but it is in JSON, uh, not directly. I mean, you obviously can you know, put it into a JSON statement, um, but it's not JSON. That help? It does help. Thank you. Phil Long, you have the floor now. Thank you for your patience. Can you hear me? Yes. yes yeah. All right. Thank you, Christopher. And thank you, Wolf. Um, that was a really helpful um, orientation to clearly a complex topic. I just had a really simple question. At the very beginning, you mentioned that you were able, uh, doing this essentially eliminates um, the check the sections of the tree that you're aligning, um, and presumably uh, that means it's actually not transmitted. It's it's not hashing those things that the individual receiving it can't um, uh, view and or um, uh, translate or otherwise um, un recover the information in it. It's removing it from the actual credential uh, that is that is transmitted and received by the recipient. That is correct. So, I mean, there are some subtleties here. Um, again, we're trying to keep this simple, um, not use a whole bunch of advanced cryptography and things. And, you know, I can talk to you exactly when you must really do BBS plus proofs or things of that nature. But most of the time, 99% of the time, you just basically either want to provide the, da the data, um, don't provide the data, and then there's sort of an orthogonal question of, are you going to salt the data for anti-correlation? So again, this requires a different sense of thinking. We, we do have a sense sometimes in the, you know, as a trust architect, it's like, oh, everything should be selectively disclosed, you know, uh, you know, disclosed, we should, you know, uh, you know, nothing should be correlatable, et cetera. Um, but I think you have to turn that upside down and say, no, you need to design very carefully. There are some things that must be correlated or it won't work because that's the whole point of a credential is you're correlating that somebody graduated with the person who graduated. And um, so there is correlation things that are important. Um, uh, but, you know, what is the persistence of that correlation? You know, an institution doesn't need signature privacy. A user might. Um, uh, you know, so you consult things such that, you know, uh, things can't be reused or somebody can't try to play games. But in some cases, uh, salting, uh, uh, you know, not salting can be advantageous. So um, there are some design uh, considerations. Uh, if Wolf? I can give a quick, yeah, really quick, um, you know, uh, intuitive kind of understanding of this. If a person's name is John Smith and you hash that, you get a particular, you know, uh, fingerprint back. And uh, if you know what that fingerprint is for John Smith, you can search a large database, find every hash that's identical and say, oh, this correlates to John Smith. So theoretically, if you have unsalted hashes, you can find every John Smith in the database without that data being actually present just by its hash. So Christopher referred to salting. Salting because uh, it's a tree, because you can have assertions on anything. You can have random data asserted on, uh, which is called salt, asserted on a name. And therefore, what that does, because that's part of the tree of that name, when the name is alighted, the hash is unique um, in the whole world. And so you can have, you know, 15,000 John Smiths, and every single one of them in this kind of document will have a different hash on their name, and you won't be able to correlate them. So that's the kind of thing Christopher is talking about there. Yeah. That's, so, a good, that's a good example, I think. Thank, thank you. We'll... Yeah. And just to be also clear, so uh, uh, the... The SD Jot and uh, uh, LD Merkel um, both have uh, salting um, in them, uh, but they're in order to save space. In the case of the uh, SD Jot, they basically have one salt, and then they basically create children's salts from that one salt, um, which has some pros and cons. It means you're only salting the individual, you know, once. You're you're only having to to put, um, uh, you know, uh, a few bytes in per uh, the entire credential. Uh, but it also really limits what you can do there. And one of the consequences of that is they often, 
uh, you know, they kind of have two blobs. Here are the things that can be alighted, and then here's the things that uh, can't be alighted. Um, in Gordian, there isn't really a difference. Everything can be alighted. Um, so, if I can, if I can ask one other quick question, you mentioned that Gordian aligns with both edge graphs as well as um, as node graphs. Um, that would suggest then that property graphs are are natively supportable within. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Um, Mahesh, I see you in the queue here. You have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Great presentation, Christopher and Wolf. Uh, just a quick question. Maybe this is very clear to everybody else, but you know, I just wanted to clarify. So in the example you just gave about, let's say that John Smith really wants to reveal his name. Uh, to you know, an institution so that they can know that it is John Smith. So how does the verifier actually decrypt any piece of disclosed information, right? Uh, whatever they disclose, how do they decrypt and, and know who you are, right? Uh, so in that sense, you know, one, if you give somebody your name, you know, so I'm John, I'm Christopher Allen, you know, I graduated. And here is my credential uh, to uh, an, you know a hiring institution. Um, you have the 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 the, the, the in, that in particular institution that hiring body has that information. It's not encrypted, okay, um, and it's very easy to tell that the uh, educational institution has uh, um, issued it because there's a signature associated with it. And, uh, you know, and there's the you know, ongoing problem of, okay, so now how do you identify that I'm Christopher Allen? And that can be done sure. within the credential in some way or some external uh, method of, of doing that authentication, et cetera. The, the, hard, the harder problem is that, let's say I'm applying for a job, okay? And the job says I need to have a laser welding safety certificate for that job, okay? Um, so, uh, I have that. I can basically prove that I have that, and I can give them a, you know, a DID and how to contact me with it, whatever. But I don't need to give them that I'm, you know, that I'm uh, Muhammad Jones, you know, Muhammad something, and I uh, got my degree from an accredited institution in um, uh, in Central Europe. Um, uh, I can just basically say, you know. I, I have a degree from a European credentialed uh, school, and I have this have this um, uh, uh, particular credential that you are asking for. And uh, now, you you know, are you interested in interviewing me? And if you're not interested in interviewing me, I'm not going to give you any more information. So there, this is what I mean by progressive disclosure. And again, I have a whole article on you know kind of what the implications of that are. So the next step is the you know the company comes back and says, yeah, you know, we really like you know what information you've given you. We've given you. We'd like an interview. You may reveal some other information, which might be how to contact you and Zoom links and other different things of that nature. Uh, endorsements in the form of badges. Uh, personal endorsements. I've been long encouraging uh, Kim Hamilton to put uh, peer endorsements into the schema so that you guys are working on. So you'll present a few of those. Again, being sensitive to privacy. And when they actually make you an offer and you accept that offer, that's when you might actually give, oh, here is my uh, you know, equivalent of social security number. I might prove that I have, I can have a field that basically says, you know, social security number, uh, is alighted and signed by another institution that basically says, yes, we have their social security number. So he actually does have a social security number. I don't have to give it to you until you give me a job because you don't need it until you give me a job. Um, so that's progressive trust. It, you know, that is, uh, um, you know, I think increasingly how we have to think about our designs. Super. Uh, if I might slip in another question, I was really curious about the graphic display of the hash itself. Uh, it seems very fascinating as a human way of kind of, you know, uh, interpreting uh, what is just a, a, a jumble of numbers. So is there some, can you say a few words about it as to what kind of uh, technology that is? Sure, yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in the, the, uh, the link to the um, LifeHash uh, page 
And if you take a look at that page, Wolf will talk about it. Yeah, so uh, LifeHash uh, was my conception and implementation. Um, as a kid, I became familiar with an algorithm known as John Conway's Game of Life, which is not really a game. It's a cellular automata. Uh, automata. Uh, and it produces these patterns, which are very can start with very simple to a simple grid of black and white squares, and it evolves along very kind of organic lines as you watch it. And uh, I was inspired to create what's called uh, often called a um, um, uh, a a visual hash, based on the idea that because you give it unique input, you get unique output. And using a number of techniques to kind of retain the whole history of this evolving pattern called life. Uh, and then using mirroring and coloring to make it even more kind of uh, interpretable by people's you know, minds, I was able to come up with a system where pretty much um, any two uh, pieces of data can go in. And even if they're very similar, they come up with very different visuals. Um, and, you know, uh, and they're very difficult to, it's very difficult to come up with two pieces of data that actually come up with visually uh, indistinguishable hashes, uh, nywall and impossible, I think. And so, um, and we published this as an open source specification. We have several different implementations. Other people have uh, converted the implementation to other languages. So uh, we're very happy to see that it's being uh, adopted and kind of inspiring people as well. And that's part of our mission is to, um, you know, uh, be compassionate about these kinds of things. Working with long strings of numbers, especially trying to find, you know, where they might differ is not a very easy cognitive task. And so, um, you know, from a UX perspective, the, you know, this isn't the only system that does these kinds of visual hashes. Uh, this is the one we, we developed and we think it has a, a lot of uh, kind of um, approachability uh, compared to some others. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, and all the information is there at lifehash.info. In fact, you can enter strings and see the life hashes change. You can have it generate random life hashes and kind of compare them and kind of see for yourself uh, and then download the software and, and, and deploy it yourself. Uh, so it's just open for anybody to use. And of course, you know, to be clear from a cryptographer's perspective, there we do not have a proof that this is as strong a hash, uh, uh, this visual hash is as strong a hash as a, uh, you know, SHA-256 or, you know, even MD5. Um, the, uh, but that's not the point. Uh, you know, we do have strong machine readable hashes that allow for, uh, that have the uh, cryptographic uh, details that we need. We just need to be able to give an additional hint to users. Um, and uh, this, this uh, helps, um, uh, you know, yeah, we often recommend this be used in conjunction with at least like eight digits of the of a hash itself of the actual uh, hexadecimal digits, um, and that way users have kind of multimodal ways of quickly verifying that uh, a hash is the same across providers. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question, uh, Christopher and Wolf. Thank you very much for coming here today. We appreciate this. I'll get the minutes published soon. Um, so thanks again, everybody. Thanks for being here. Have a good week. See you next week. Take care. Thank you, everybody. I put